All right, 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to cover this chapter today. And uh, real quickly before I get into it, um, really major, major answer to prayer. Uh, a lot of people have been praying for us uh, for the last couple of months. Um, when we were up in McKean County, uh, Pennsylvania, we call it gas land because there were gas wells everywhere and our water was tainted and everything else, bad situation. But when we were up there, um, we were talking about what should we do and everything. And we decided that we would go and find a place to stay and that we would spend the summer um, saving our money and praying about where the Lord would have us go. And then late summer, early fall, we'd try to find a property if it was all according to the will of the Lord. And I know a lot of you have known about that. A lot of you have been praying. And uh, the fact is we did find a property. Or rather, I should say the Lord showed us a property. And um, it is in the state of Maine. Okay, I'm not going to say a whole lot about the details right now. We will be filming some up there from our property that we're buying. Uh, it's just land. There's no buildings on it. It's very remote. Uh, we thank the Lord for it. There's going to be a lot of challenges getting stuff from here in southern, southeastern Pennsylvania, the whole way up to the state of Maine. Arrows Duke County is actually where it's at, so it's the northernmost county of Maine. So, uh, but we're very, very excited. Uh, real quick little story just to tell you that the Lord is in this thing. Just amazing. Um, back when I got saved, uh, I was about, well, when I was 25 years old, very first church I went to, um, and I'm, I'm going to just say this, in my testimony, it's actually on Sermon Audio, I say I got saved at eight years of age, but I've, as I've been praying and studying the whole thing, I don't believe that that was a real salvation. I think it was a false profession. I was just a child. I didn't really understand. But um, when I really got saved at 25, that's when I started to believe and read the King James Bible. And uh, everything just changed for me. My whole life changed at that point. I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. And the very first church that I went to um, was actually Cornerstone Baptist Church um, here in Lancaster County. And I was there and I was really studying and really learning a lot of things on my own actually. Not so much coming from the teaching that was done there by the PhD who's now just totally ruined. Um, bad situation. I won't get into all that. Um, but uh, I was learning a lot on my own and I actually had a chance to teach a um, whole seminar on Bible versions there. And uh, I found out very quickly that not all Baptists are King James Bible believing. Quite the contrary. So I ended up leaving Cornerstone Baptist Church and that's really when uh, things started to really kick into high gear for me spiritually. Uh, if I would have stayed there at that dead building, I would have remained in the congregation of the dead and I'd have never amounted to anything. So, my real spiritual life began at Cornerstone Baptist Church, but it really kicked into high gear when I left there. And it's interesting because the property that my wife and I are buying is actually where the road turns back to the left, right at the end of that road, there's a church. Do you have any idea what it's called? Cornerstone Baptist Church. I am not lying. Same exact name as the one I went to when I first got saved. Absolutely incredible. And when I left it, that's when the Lord really blessed me. Very interesting. So you go to this Cornerstone Baptist Church and you turn left to get back to the property. So just an incredible, I mean, we're just, you know, almost doing cartwheels. I'm not athletic, so I don't physically, you know, literally do cartwheels. But it's been a real blessing to see how the Lord has been working. And uh, I can't say it's all because of us and our spirituality. It's a lot of you out there, your prayers. Uh, your prayers and, and imploring the Lord to give us a property where we can go and we can live and then we can really get into ministry. I mean... The, the ministry right now has been very disorganized because we are at a, at a temporary place. We can't organize the way we want to organize. We just have a temporary P.O. box. I mean, it just, everything's temporary. It drives me crazy. I'm somebody that likes order and, and, and having everything organized. It drives me crazy when things are chaotic. And so it's been a very challenging um, being down here and not having that organization. So again, Everybody out there, thank you so much for praying. Um, 
We did find the property. I'll be giving more details on that in the future. And, uh, but of course now, now it's going to be really challenging going, you know, moving 12 hours away. Um, well, actually it's more like 14, I think, actually. <laughs> so it's going to be a challenge. And uh, of course having to go there and build and everything else. And, and uh, we're very, very, very excited. And, and thank you to everybody out there that prayed. So just a little update. Um, thank you for your prayers. Huh? Okay, my wife just reminded me um, to also thank everybody out there for their donations. And, you know, I get a little absent-minded sometimes. It's not that I'm not thankful. It's just I get a lot on my mind. So, yes, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for the donations as well. Everybody out there that's, that's uh, given to the ministry, we really appreciate that. Couldn't do it without you guys. Um, it just, there's a lot that goes on. Uh, probably the biggest, one of the biggest things that I do in the ministry is actually email. Um, emailing people, writing to people and things. You don't see that on YouTube. You don't see the people that I am in contact with. Um, I'm trying to actually, I re that's another thing I want to mention very quickly. Um, I did actually remove my personal email address from kingjamesvideoministries.com simply because I have to slow things down here while we are building, while we are moving and things. Um, I, I'm not going to have time. That's, that's just the way it is. I mean, I want to keep bringing videos out. It's very important that I do that, have new material coming out. Um, so I can't be doing that and the emailing and everything else right now. So um, thank you, everybody out there, for your prayers and for your donations. Okay, turning your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you aren't there already. A lot of very interesting things in this passage. Let's begin here. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay, now there are two ways that you can define that. All right, first of all, some shall depart from the faith. And they say, well, how can you depart from the faith if you were never in it? See, so these, this would have to be talking about Christians, really truly saved Christians that depart from the faith. Well, that can be true, and certainly there are Christians, I believe, that are saved and they've gotten messed up doctrinally. Um, and we're going to see those doctrines where they're messed up here as we continue in the study. But there's another way to look at this thing. Some shall depart from the faith. What is the faith? Well, if you look in Jude chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Okay, what's the faith in Jude 1, 3? It is Christianity. What the Bible calls, they were called Christians first in Antioch. So, that faith, you know, you don't have to earnestly contend to be saved, but that faith there, the faith of Christianity, is something that somebody can depart from that system and not have even ever been saved. Okay, And I think that that's a lot of what's going on here in these last days. I think that there are a lot of false professing uh, believers out there. And, you know, it's, it's a very, very difficult thing, and I struggle with it all the time. I know a lot of you struggle with it. Who is really saved? Who's really lost? It's difficult. I mean, there are so many levels of deception now. People get so mixed up. It's hard to tell sometimes. I mean, you know, you can tell when somebody's really genuinely saved. They're going to have their attitude towards the King James Bible is going to be one of belief, not this hatred and, and militant attacking the King James Bible. I don't, I don't believe somebody like that is saved um, I know that there are people that, that listen to the James Whites and the, the losers like that, and they get confused on the issue. Okay, I understand that. All right, I, I, I can fully understand. I mean, somebody goes off to a Bible, you know, university somewhere, and they get their head messed up, but they're really saved. Yeah, I understand that. But when you see people that are studying the Bible version issue, and they know what stands we take to prove this book, and they use it and twist it and turn it against us, Ew, I just, I don't believe somebody like that's saved. I don't believe somebody like that is a Christian. There should be a love for the truth there. I mean, Jesus Christ in John 14, 6 calls himself the truth. So if you don't love the truth and you attack the truth, yet you're saved? I don't really think so. But the fact of the matter is here, whichever way you interpret this, there are people 
that in the latter times they're going to depart from the faith. Okay, they're going to depart from true Bible-believing Christianity. Now, of course, this proves the King James Bible is not true because we don't see any of this today, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people that have departed from Bible-believing Christianity. You look back at the last, you know, the church history, what Christians, true Bible believers stood for all through that time. Very small, persecuted body of believers that often were meeting out here in farce and meeting in different places in secret and things, being persecuted by Catholicism and Protestantism, you know. Um, yeah, we've pretty much had the same beliefs for almost 2,000 years now. But you see people today, and they're doing all sorts of these weird things, um, bringing in rock music, you know, and calling it Christian, and, and all these other strange beliefs and strange practices. They have departed from the faith. But let's continue here. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. These people that depart from the faith, here's what they do. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Kind of like uh, somebody standing up in the pulpit and saying, the Word of God says, and they're holding up a book or pointing to a book that's laid out on the pulpit, you know, like this. And they're saying, the Word of God says, and you talk to them in private, and you say, is that book really God's perfect Word? Oh, no, it's not perfect. A better translation, you know. You know, and, and I harp on this thing a lot, you know, and a lot of people get upset with me and stuff, and they go, oh, you, you know, leave the Bible version issue out of it. But it's the major issue. You see, if I'm calling a book God's Word, then it has to be perfect. And I can't correct it. Because if I can correct God's Word, then that proves that I'm smarter than God. And that God's made mistakes. And I can get up there and say, uh, Lord, it's a shame you didn't have me when you wrote the Bible because, you see, I know the Greek and Hebrew better than you do. You know, <laughs> I'm not about to say that. This book is God's book. I don't correct it. It corrects me. It's just so simple. But you have these people who depart from the faith and they speak lies in hypocrisy. And there's no greater, greater level of hypocrisy than preaching from a book that you're calling God's Word when in reality you don't believe it. That's bad. That's real bad. But it says there that their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Now if you remember 1 Timothy chapter 1, it says there in uh, verse 5, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. You're supposed to have a good conscience. You're supposed to have a good thought life. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. You should have a good conscience. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9 says, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now let me ask you a question. Who more than a preacher should have a good conscience? I mean, I'm not trying to say that a preacher is called to this very high level and should be perfect, sinlessly perfect, and a Christian, as a Christian, you can do whatever you want. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, if you get a guy that's up there preaching the word to you, he should have a good conscience. And he should not be speaking with a double tongue, you know. His faith should be unfeigned. It should be real. He should be real. You know, and again, I've talked about this in other sermons, particularly the carnival preacher's sermon. If you have a man that's preaching one way and, you know, and making his voice do certain things up behind the pulpit, and then he doesn't talk that way when he's down off the pulpit, I wouldn't stay in a place like that to save my life. I mean, that's bad. And you get to some guy up and he's up there and he's preaching and he's, the Bible says that the word of God and all this stuff. What is that? Say, watch out for that. A preacher should be real. First Timothy chapter four, verse three. Let's go on to the next verse. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. There's that T word again, truth. But you see there, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Hmm. Is there a uh, church that uh, requires that of certain people? Catholicism? Mm-hmm. Sure. 
You say, well, that's just Catholicism. That's not in Protestantism. Oh, uh, well, actually, yes, it is. But uh, there in uh, verse 1, 1 Timothy 4, 1, it said about seducing, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And then it lists what these things are. And it says, commanding to abstain from meats. Hmm. The New American Standard Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 says, Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God cre has created to be gratefully shared in those and by those who believe and know the truth. Foods? It's not foods, it's meats. Vegetarianism. And if you want to go even worse than that, veganism. Real bad. How about the HCSB, the Holman Christian Satanic, oh, I mean Standard Bible. Verse 3, they forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. Hmm. Again, a new perversion. By the test there in 1 Timothy chapter 4, this new perversion is showing that it has doctrines of devils in it and seducing spirits. Why? It's covering up for the condemnation, the Bible condemnation against vegetarianism. And you'll see that. I've met Christians, professing Christians, and they'll start this thing of, oh, you've got to get your health in line, you know, and, and your health is so important, and you better stay away from red meat. Well, if the red meat is, is hormones and, you know, all kinds of horrible things in factory farm and all that stuff, well, I agree, would agree with that. But if you can find some good grass-fed beef, that stuff's good for you, including the fat. Mm -hmm. You say it's fattening. Amen. Yes, it is. God created it to be received with thanksgiving. That doesn't mean just the holiday either, by the way. It means you thank Him for it. Watch out for professing Christians who tell you to abstain from red meat. Watch out for that. That's a doctrine of a devil. How about the Amplified Bible? Who forbid people to marry and teach them to abstain from certain kinds of foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and have an increasingly clear knowledge of the truth. You know, yeah. How about the New King James Version? Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. One more. How about the Living Bible? They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat meat, even though God gave these things to well-taught Christians to enjoy and be thankful for. Now, if one of them can get it right, why can't the others get it right? See, it's not, well, they're using this, this special text that's more accurate than what the King James translators had, and they, they have this up-to-date, more, better, you know, uh-huh. No, one of them got the text right. See? And I mean, just think about the reading. To abstain from certain kinds of foods. What does that mean? That can be anything. You know? Some guy could stand up and say, hey, you know what? You really shouldn't eat high fructose corn syrup. And you go, oh, doctrine of devils. That's a doctrine of devils because you told me to, do, to abstain from certain kinds of foods. See? Hey, you know what? Bromelated vegetable, vegetable oils and, and hydrogenated vegetable oils and stuff. That stuff's bad for you. Oh, oh no. Doctrine of devils. See? Just saying certain kind of foods, that doesn't do anything. No, the doctrine of devils that's condemned there in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 is when people tell you to abstain from meats. So, by this very test right here, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, the new versions are proven to have a seducing spirit in them. So when I say that these new versions are satanic, I'm not fooling around. It's the truth. Well, let's continue here. Verse 4, verses 4 and 5. 1 Timothy 4, verses 4 and 5. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Okay, and again, I've talked about this in other studies, the danger of convenience sermon, I talked about it. Notice it does not say every type of food is good. It says every creature is good. That means if I want to come out here to the woods and I see a gray squirrel running up this tree, I can get him, take him down and skin him and, and cook him over a fire and eat him. I see a snake crawling on the ground. If it was really, really, if I was really, really, really hungry... <laughs> I can kill the snake and I can cook it on a fire and eat it. 
I can see a slug over there, I can see a grub, a wood grub over here, I can see a deer over there, I can see whatever. If it's out here in these woods and it's a creepy crawly thing, every creature of God is good to thee for food and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. And believe me, I'd have to do a lot of praying before I would eat a snake. <laughs> and I'd have to be very, very, very hungry for that. But the point is, if things would get so bad that you'd be starving, you can't, you don't go back under the Old Testament laws and say clean and unclean meats. No, everything now is, is sanctified and you can sanctify it by the word of God in prayer. Okay, Acts chapter 10, you can turn there. We're going to see this thing here. When did this law change where you have the Old Testament clean and unclean meats and it changes? Acts chapter 10 verses 9 through 16. Okay, it says here, On the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up, up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they, were, they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. And it goes on to talk about a lot of things there. We aren't going to read everything. But this vision was given to Peter for two reasons. Okay, First of all, the Jews now no longer are on that under that Old Testament Levitical law where you have the clean and unclean meats. Where, you know, like you can't eat pig meat, you know, in the Old Testament. Now you can there's no law in the Bible saying that you can't eat bacon or pork chops or ham or something like that. You can eat that. That's fine. Okay. But there's a second reason why this vision was given to Peter. Okay. The first one was the actual physical application there. You can eat any meat. And you know that by comparing it, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Compare Acts chapter 10 with 1 Timothy chapter 4. So you know that you can now eat any kind of meat. But the second reason for it is because the Gent or the excuse me the Jews believe that the Gentiles are like animals; they're unclean. Okay, that's why they call you a dog. All right, a dog would be an unclean animal. All right, you don't eat dogs. Um, you know you can now if you really would have to, but you know a Jew in the Old Testament, a, a dog was an unclean animal, and so they see a Gentile, they go, oh, a dog," you know, and now God is saying. I've cleansed that Gentile over there. Don't call him unclean. See, he's clean because he's been washed in the blood. So there's a spiritual application. There's a physical application. And you can't rule out either one. You can't say, well, it's all spiritual, not physical. And you can't say it's all physical, not spiritual. It's there. Okay. God has given us animals to eat for meat. And you have to have animal fats, and protein in your diet. You cannot pretend that we are in the Garden of Eden or before the flood and that you can live on vegetables and fruits. Okay? You can't do that. The fruits and vegetables back then and the nuts and everything, the protein from the nuts, it was different. Okay? They lived to be 900 some years old back there before the flood. Why? Because the atmosphere was different. Things were different back then. They didn't have to eat meat. We're not there anymore. You have to eat meat today. It's perfectly fine. Okay, Jesus ate meat when he was here on the earth. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. You can go back there in your Bible. Okay, it says here, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. A good preacher will warn his people about doctrines of devils, like the new, like what you see in the new perversions, and uh, he'll also warn about forced vegetarianism, celibacy, things like that. Okay, um, that's the mark of a good preacher. When you get a good, or when you get a man that's a preacher and he's not ever talking about the Bible version issue because it's controversial and he doesn't want to offend people and things. I mean, you, you know, 
you're going to offend people when you start to rip on the new versions. You're going to offend people when you start to rip on vegetarianism. And, you know, when you start to talk about marriage and the proper roles within marriage, that's another big, you know, hot topic, as they say. And you'll offend people. And a good preacher uh, is not tr somebody that wants to purposefully offend people, because that can get kind of carnal. A good preacher is somebody that will just say, well, I'm going to preach the truth, and if it offends, sorry about that but I'm not going to back down on the truth. See, a good minister will be somebody that will talk about controversial issues and show where it lines up with the Bible or, you know, where the Bible condemns it. Verse 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Interesting because there's a lot of old wives' fables out there, a lot of old wives that have come out with fables, I should say it that way. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society, uh, a devil-possessed lunatic. Okay, uh, some of her writings were were very much loved by Adolf Hitler. Okay, how about Ellen White, Mary Baker Eddy, Elizabeth Clare Prophet, New Age nut, Anne Graham, Billy Graham's daughter. She's a preacher, you know. How about uh, Butch Meyer? I mean uh, Joyce Meyer. Watch out for these women that, that get into teaching positions and things like that. Be careful about that. Verse 8. Okay, it talked about exercising yourself there. Verse 7. Now he defines what that exercise is. 1 Timothy 4, 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation okay now as a Christian you do need to keep yourself in good shape physically okay that is very very important why well because we are running a race right and if you don't keep yourself in good shape physically you're not going to be doing too well serving Jesus Christ and you know again I'm I'm not you know some guy that's been in perfect health all my life I mean up until you know, a year and a half, two years ago when I got married, I didn't even really care about my health. I mean, I, I ate a lot of fast food. I, I ate junk food and things like that. I mean, I ate ice cream just about every night. I was not in very good shape physically. I've always had a very high metabolism, so I didn't really gain huge amounts of weight. But, you know, uh, eating right is not, is not an easy thing at first. When you start to eat right, then it's, it gets easier, it gets better. But, uh, there are a lot of people that are not eating right, and they're not getting exercise, and it affects their health. They're getting all kinds of diseases. They can barely walk. I mean, it's, and, you know, it affects your thought life, too. It's bad. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. You can go there in your Bible. We're going to see about this thing of the, the importance of staying in good physical condition. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 says... Know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Okay? Now, it was very important back there in the first century to stay in good shape. Um, Paul wasn't taking, you know, getting down to the local airport and, you know, working up his frequent flyer miles as he flew around to preach to the different uh, churches there. No, the churches were groups of people there in the Bible, and they should be that way today too. And Paul was flying around. Or, yeah, Paul was walking, excuse me, walking around to these different places. You know, I mean, look at the look in the back of your Bible sometime at the, the little map there that talks about Paul's missionary journeys. You know, you go back there and you see these little red dots, you know, dee, 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 going over these countries. I mean, we're talking extreme amounts of hiking. Now you have Paul and he's there and he's like, you know, boy, I'm going to, tomorrow I got to leave, uh, you know, for Corinth. And I'm over here in Ephesus, and it's going to be a couple days' journey. And 
But uh, let's see, what should I pack? Um, I think I'm gonna pack some cream-filled donuts and uh, probably some chocolate Hershey Kisses and uh, maybe a couple cans of soda. I'm being sarcastic, I know they didn't have that stuff back then, but how do you think he would have done hiking like that? Walking and walking and walking if he would have been in poor health and been eating junk food. Not very good. Well, now we have the modern day convenience of automobiles and other ways of travel that can get you around different places. You know, and you say, uh, I think the Lord's calling me to go down and do some tracting at this shopping mall. Okay, uh, what should you be eating before you go? If you're in really bad shape, really poor shape, are you going to be able to go down there and walk around and hand out tracks? Um, you want to put together a video for here on YouTube. You want to teach a uh, certain subject from the Bible. Are you going to be able to do that if you've been spending four or five hours watching nonsense videos? No. you got to keep that body in check. You have to stay focused on Scripture. And I'll, I'm going to tell you right now, much study is a weariness to the flesh. You're going to have times when you're going to pick up this Bible and you're going to say, okay, i got to get to this study. i got to, I got to read here and whatever. And You open it up and you start reading and... Uh, you know, and you're, you're falling asleep, and uh, your flesh is going to resist studying this book. That's why you have to keep under your body and bring it into subjection. It's very important to remember that. Now go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Okay, it says here, for therefore, I'm sorry, verse 10, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Notice there in verse 10 it says that Jesus died for all men. He's the Savior of all men. Now see, the hyper-Calvinist comes along and they say, yes, but see, that's all elect men. I didn't see the word elect there in verse 10. Maybe I'm just not seeing it. Or maybe it's not there. And see, notice the distinction. He's the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So then, what does it take to have Jesus as your Savior? Belief. That's why the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? Whosoever shall call. So, it's open to anybody, but there's action required on their part. They have to come to God and say, I mean, you come to God and you just say, I believe. You know, why? Why do you believe? See, no, you've got to come to God as a sinner. Understanding heaven is real, hell is real. I'm a sinner according to the standards of the Bible. And I'm going to go to hell unless I do something about it. And I can't do anything about it in my own power. So I'm going to have to trust in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So I'm coming to God as a sinner and saying, I need to be saved. I believe that Jesus dying on the cross is enough to pay for my sins. See? So, He is the Savior of all men. Anybody out there can get saved. There's no one out there that's going to get to heaven and say, I didn't even have a chance. I wasn't one of the elect. You know, you didn't die for me. You know, you died for all them Christians, but you didn't die on the cross for me, you know, Jesus. Nobody's going to be able to say that. Jesus died for all but only those who believe on His name are going to make it into heaven. It's so simple. Okay, and notice it says there in verse 11, these things command and teach. Interesting. There are lots of commandments in the Bible, in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. The fact of the matter is sometimes a young man who's called to preach will do better and no better, excuse me, no more of the Bible than an older man. Many times that'll happen. Now, watch out for the thing of a man being a novice, like we read about in chapter 3, sure, you know, you don't want to have a novice get up there and be running his mouth. And, and even if you are a younger preacher and you're really understanding the Bible and stuff like that, be careful how you talk to the elderly, okay? Uh, one of the best things that you can do as a Christian, 
especially if you're young, if you're a teenager, start hanging around the older people in your congregation. Get around some of the elderly Christians. Learn from the elderly. You don't want to learn from the teenagers if you're a teenager. Okay? Develop a respect and a reverence for older people. That's very important. Okay? And if you start to get to a point where you really start to know the Bible and the Lord starts to put you into various types of ministry and open doors for you, where you're able to go and you're able to witness to people and stuff like that, and some of the older people start to come down on you because they get jealous or something, well, let no man despise thy youth. That doesn't mean then you get cocky and arrogant with the older people. You still need to respect the elderly. Okay, that's still very important. But don't let their um, negativity discourage you away from the ministry. Let no man despise thy youth. Okay, verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Okay, and here we go back again to this thing of having a good report. Okay, a good conscience before God. We're having a stink bug infestation here in the southern part of Pennsylvania, so you're going to see me doing a lot of this today, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. But praise the Lord, I'll be moving away from all this before real long. But anyhow... Um, Verse 16, we'll finish up here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Well then, see, we all have to work hard to be saved. We have to continually stay working hard for Jesus Christ in order to be saved, right? No. Your salvation is finished the minute that the Lord says, Okay, you've come to me as a sinner. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. I purchase you with my blood. Boom. You're sealed under the day of redemption. Done. Salvation's over. Okay? You're on your way to heaven whether you like it or not. But, now you can make a mess of your life. See, one of the big attacks that people that don't like eternal security, they'll come along and say, you're saying that I can do any sin at all and, can, and still go to heaven. You know, you're, are you really saying that? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, that's not fair. That's not a just system. Oh, it's very just. Because you see, if you sin in this life, you can destroy yourself. You can destroy your testimony. You can destroy your joy. You can destroy your health. You can destroy heavenly riches. You can destroy a millennial inheritance. You can destroy everything. But you can't destroy your salvation. That's very important. And let me tell you something. If you get into ministry, there are a number of things that the devil's going to throw at you to try and destroy you and bring you down. And if the devil can get those things into your life, if he can get you to start doing these things, you will shipwreck your ministry. You will end up on the rocks somewhere. I mentioned it earlier, this Cornerstone Baptist Church. This guy that was a pastor there, and I might have mentioned this in other sermons, but I'll say it one more time. He was a PhD. You know? And I think it was a Tennessee Temple or Dallas Theological Seminary or one of them or something, but he was a PhD, smart man, and uh, things started to go kind of haywire, and, and he got a job, a side job, because, you know, the membership wasn't that great there in the Fallis house, and they had the payments and everything, because they just rebuilt, you know, and uh, put all this money into the new building, and so he was there working, and, and uh, actually tried to fornicate with two different women, and uh, he was married and had children. And uh, ended up being removed from the pastorate there at this Cornerstone Baptist Church. And uh, last I heard, he was working full-time at some job. And, and all of a sudden, I guess I don't know what happened, but he left his wife and children. How could you go from a man being a Ph.D., senior pastor of a Baptist church, and you go from that to now living in some cruddy little apartment somewhere, away from your wife, away from the Lord, hating the Lord, and everything else. Hmm. You see, he didn't take heed to the fact that he was going to be attacked. 
he didn't take heed to the reality that there's a lot of sin out there and that he needed to stay away from things. He didn't take heed. So what did he do? He didn't save himself. He didn't save himself from a lot of grief, from a lot of trouble. And I actually saw this guy, this very pastor, I saw him behind my truck the one time. And if you've seen the other videos, you know I have bumper stickers on the back of my truck talking about the gospel. And this guy, instead of being back there smiling, he had this m nasty, miserable look on his face. He didn't know it was me because I had, back when I was going there, I didn't have that truck. And he, I guess he didn't see it was me driving it because I was in front of him and I turned off then. But the fact is, he had this nasty, miserable look on his face. Just bitterness all over his face. You'd think a man that's a PhD and a Christian, professing Christian, would be happy to be, be behind a truck with a gospel on it. But uh, what happened? He destroyed himself because he didn't take heed. So that's going to be it for 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to go on to chapter 5 here in uh, the next study. But uh, before we do, let's close with a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for this study. And I just pray, Lord, for the people out there that they would stay away from vegetarianism. I pray, Lord, that they would stay away from uh, celibacy and, and uh, all these other doctrines of devils, Lord, that they would stay away from these new versions which come from the Vatican, the very people who are guilty of commanding to abstain from meat and forbidding to, to marry. Um, Lord, I just pray for the people out there that they'd be careful who they would listen to and stay away from old wives' fables and uh, that they would stay in your word and that they would not give any time at all to these false prophets that are out there just running rampant and uh, that people would take heed, Lord, to your word. They would stay in good shape, uh, both physically and spiritually. And I just pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that's going to be it. We will see you in next week in our study of 1 Timothy chapter 5.